Well, good afternoon. This is such a quiet group. You're so <laughs> quiet. Um, welcome to uh, 21st Century NORAD, how Canada and the United States can confront our shared cyber threat. Um, I'd like to send a special welcome <clears throat> to you who first time visited the center and also to those of you watching on the webcast and those of you watching in the future. Um, I'm David Biet. I'm director of the Wilson Center's Canada Institute. Um, we work to increase awareness and knowledge about Canada and U.S.-Canada relations among U.S. policy and opinion leaders. We focus primarily on three areas, energy and environment, trade, and borders and border security. And this issue kind of fits in most of those. So just a little background for those of you new to the Wilson Center. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars is <clears throat> the United States' official memorial to the 28th president, founded by an act of Congress in 1968. Wilson was our only president with a PhD. <clears throat> we are the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for Congress, the administration, and the broader policy community. I'm pleased to introduce my relatively new colleague, Jiwon Kim, today, who will be our moderator. Jiwon has considerable public and private sector experience, having worked as an advisor to several members of Congress and has been in charge of cybersecurity operations for a corporation. <clears throat> she currently serves on the Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Int Integrity Advisory Committee. <clears throat> and our two speakers today, on my far right, your left, Paul Rosenzweig. <clears throat> He's the founder of Red Branch Lawn Consulting, and he formerly served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security, and twice as Acting Assistant Secretary for International Affairs. On my immediate right, on <clears throat> Uh, your right is Mark Fabro. Mark is president and chief security scientist um, of Lofty Perch. He's the founder and chairperson of the Canadian Industrial Cybersecurity Council and sits on the Utilities Telecom Council Smart Network Security Committee. More extensive biographies are found on the sheet that we passed out and will be uh, posted at the website for those of you who are watching uh, uh <coughs> later. Um, but before I turn over to the program to Jiwon. First of all, emergency, you can go out to the left, out to the right, and to the right, just in case. We did have an earthquake a couple years ago, and although they want you to stay in place now, I think. We do hope to have plenty of time for questions for our two guests, and I would ask you to wait for the microphone, and please introduce yourself before asking your question. Each of our panelists will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll move on to questions. So, over to you, Jiwon. Thank you, David. Um, it is uh, such a pleasure to see all of you here today. Um, it is going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, and uh, I would just notice thing that David put me in the middle uh, between the two speakers. And uh, I think today we're talking about the cooperation and the, the coordination of the two countries, US and Canada. Um, although I, I believe we're going to have a very interesting um, uh, conversation from, from both of the speakers' perspectives. Uh, and Paul just mentioned to me that he was the first uh, chair of the DPAC, which is a Data Privacy and Integrity um, Advisory Committee um, on which I serve at the Department of Homeland Security. So I have a personal um, and professional interest in on these issues as well, and uh, I look forward to a very interesting session. Thank you very much for um, coming. Um, as David mentioned, we're going to begin first with a few remarks uh, from each of the speakers, and then we'll open up for questions. And I think Paul is the winner in that uh, order. Winner or loser? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to take just a few minutes at the beginning to to um, to set the stage for the discussion. I think uh, far more of, of our uh, value add here will be in in the interchange uh, amongst us all. But um, my uh, my story, my uh, take on this begins in 2003. Uh, you may recall the uh, Great Northeast Blackout that started in Ohio after action reports suggest it was a, a natural disaster, a tree and a transformer, and then a cascading failure. That blackout rolled through Ohio into Pennsylvania, up across the river in, and lakes into uh, southern Ontario, and then back from Canada into Michigan. Uh, it knew no boundaries and respected none because our electric grids uh, respect no boundaries. Uh, our electric grids, as most of you probably know, are aligned vertically. There's an eastern grid and a western grid that links uh, Canada and the United States. Uh, Texas, as is typical for almost everything Texan, goes its own way and is not part of either grid. Um, 
But uh, I've been doing some research lately on the uh, scope of shared infrastructure between Canada and the United States, and uh, I found that there are 37 major plus literally hundreds of minor uh, electric grid crossing uh, points across the shared international boundary uh, at which uh, energy transmission occurs. Um, fully 10%, roughly, uh, of the electricity generated in Canada is mo sold and marketed in the United States. There's a lesser amount of American-generated electricity that travels north, but in times of emergency when Canadian electric generating uh, capacity is reduced by accident or or, uh, or danger of some sort, uh, energy flows the other direction quite as well. Um, the electric grid <coughs> is only uh, one example of uh, any of a half dozen of other instances we could talk about where the critical infrastructure of the two countries is uh, not only uh, related to each other, but almost inextricably intertwined. Uh, we could talk at some length about the oil and gas pipelines, though I don't want to talk about Keystone XL right now, but, but even the existing pipelines cross the borders um, in dozens of places, almost, uh, uh, almost as if they were a shared uh, piece of critical infrastructure. Uh, our, uh, we jointly operate a critical waterway, the, the St. Louis, uh, Lawrence Waterway. Uh, that uh, that splits the two countries through a shared board. Um, and, of course, we manage the commerce on the Great Lakes together. Uh, our transportation systems are completely interwoven, uh, most notably in the air, aviation airspace, where they're almost seamless, uh, but even to a lesser degree in the rail and highway systems that, that join us. Uh, I discovered to my interest that the stock exchange in Toronto has a live connection to the New York Stock Exchange, uh, a live cyber connection, to give you a hint of where I'm going with this. And I even discovered that there are over two dozen dams on either side of the border, the failure of which would have uh, collateral effects across the border. Now, those are not shared infrastructure because they are on... Uh, respective sides of the border, but nonetheless, um, they are shared critical infrastructure in the sense that uh, a failure in the U.S. would uh, affect Canadian interests, and likewise, a failure in Canada would have collateral damage in the United States. Um, all of this is probably not news to most Canadians. It's probably much more news to most Americans. Um, uh, and it's certainly not news to anybody who attends events here at the, at the uh, Canada Institute at the Wilson Center. But what I think is the new piece of what I want to talk about is uh, the remarkable fact to me that undergirding each and every one of these critical infrastructure sectors that I've talked about, everything lies uh, shared cyber systems that uh, either are coordinated or connected in some way or other. The electric grid is, is the most significant of them because they're the, generate, the uh, cyber systems that manage the generation and transmission of electricity literally talk to each other on a real-time basis constantly in every minute of every day. Um, there is less connection in some of the other uh, areas I've talked about, but the air traffic control systems are on a live connection. Um, the waterways are on a joint system, uh, that, that is, where they're operated in a single shared service model, and so on. Um, so what all this prompts me to think about is how stupid would, say, America, and I'll, and I'll offer this from the American perspective, but how stupid would America feel if the following scenario happened? Uh, we finish the endless discussions in our Congress about cybersecurity information sharing legislation, and we pass a bill that allows a uh, seamless transmission of cyber threat information uh, from our national security agency to the private sector uh, and to the public-private sectors like the electric grid so that they can respond to perceived threats in, in the cyber domain, new, newly discovered threat vectors, newly discovered malware. Uh, using this new authority and its uh, huge amounts of resources, um, the NSA discovers a couple of things that it tells the New York uh, consumer electric uh, producer, Consolidated Edison. And Con, Con Ed spends $50 million, $100 million patching this vulnerability to its great joy so that it can now say, look, we've fixed this one piece, right? Takes six months 
And the day after they announce completion, uh, Hydro-Quebec gets hit with the same virus, and the Northeast loses 10 percent of its electric generation. Uh, because nobody ever told Hydro-Quebec about the vulnerability. Because we have no mechanism in place for allowing and enabling the sharing of cyber threat and vulnerability information generated in the United States uh, with uh, Canadian private sector uh, or critical infrastructure interests on which American uh, interests critically depend. Or, if you want to flip it about, likewise, imagine that the, the, the Canadian intelligence has the same sort of, of uh, benefit. It tells Hydro-Quebec, and nobody tells uh, their biggest customer down in New York, and, and the reverse happens. Um, this, it seems to me, is fundamentally flawed, right? And I could extend that argument not just to the cybersecurity threat and vulnerability information sharing portions of what America is thinking about doing, but likewise, to any regulatory system that America, or Canada for that matter, uh, might choose to develop. There is equally no value in uh, developing uh, intrusive cybersecurity uh, performance standards, as Congress is considering, uh, and putting American uh, critical infrastructure and industry to the large expense of meeting those standards if things upon which America relies in Canada don't change their behaviors, don't come up to those standards, and are equally at risk. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that American standards or American threat information should control. And in fact, I think that that would be the wrong answer. But what I am saying is that the reality that we need to face that is, I think, stronger in the cyber domain than in any of the other areas of cooperation uh, where, we, uh, where we already share a great deal of effort, the reality is, is that America and Canada pretty much have to go down the same road together, right? That any variation in standards between them, any variation in information sharing between them on the broad plane of cybersecurity, uh, at least as it applies to critical infrastructure, will leave one or the other of the two countries vulnerable. Uh, to the same extent as the other country remains uh, at, at a different level of protection. Now, this is a challenge. This is a really big challenge because what it strikes me this means is that we need not just a coordination model, though that would be a nice step forward in the first instance, but in the end, a shared uh, services model. In, a, in essence, a coordinated, I, I, I didn't pick the cyber NORAD um, uh, idea um, uh, the the Wilson Center did, but I think it's a, it's the right model because the our joint airspace, you know, is best managed in a shared services model that is as seamlessly integrated as possible, and the cyber domain is, if anything, less susceptible uh, to bordered uh, uh, adjudication, less susceptible to uh, interposing barriers between the two countries. Uh, and less susceptible uh, uh, to, uh, uh, or more susceptible to damage and breaking if uh, we diverge in our standards. Now, what that means, I think, for, uh, that means two things, and this is probably where I'll end. Um, for uh, America, it means that in my judgment, uh, we need to include Canada in the conversation. Whatever conversation it is we wind up deciding to have, and you know, whether it's President Obama's executive order or eventually some legislation, uh, you know, uh, your predictions is as good as mine. I'm happy to offer predictions in Q&A if you want, but they're not that valuable. Um, but it makes no sense at all to be insular. I mean, frankly, they should be as broad as we can make them to include other nations, you know, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. But at least let's include Canada where, you know, a huge fraction of what is driving the debate is threats to a critical infrastructure system, the electric grid, that isn't an American grid. You know, that is a joint grid or two joint grids. Um, the flip side of that, um, and this is to my Canadian friends in, in the room, is, and uh, my friend Teresa said this earlier, but I was going to say it, you know, Canada's going to have to uh, acknowledge that it needs to kind of step up its game a bit. Um, you know, some of what they do in cyberspace, I was reading the other day that the CCIRC, the C uh, Canadian Cyber Incident Response Center, isn't even a 24-7 uh, center. Um, and I understand why. It costs a lot of money to do something like that. But 
if we're going to go down the road of a shared services model that is that uh, fully integrated, which I think is the right answer, um, s uh, there's going to be costs and requirements uh, which to some degree will require the Canadians uh, to play a little bit of catch up and put a little bit of money and effort into the plan. Um, so I'll, I'll start, I'll sort of end there with my broad thesis statement, which is that the critical infrastructure of the two countries, perhaps uniquely uh, in, in the world, but certainly uh, 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 critically for our two countries, is so intertwined and cyber is so deeply in, enmeshed in all of these critical infrastructures that if we don't get on the same page, it will surely redound to somebody's uh, detriment. Think about Mark. Hello. Well, um, Paul, absolutely uh, outstanding. I, I don't think I'm going to um, consume all of my, my 15 minutes, uh, but I I am uh, going to agree with Paul uh, in one way, in that I think this is going to be very interesting, perhaps because of uh, the possibility of me uh, disagreeing with a number of elements that were just posed. Um, we talk of the issue of, of interoperability and between the 10 recognized sectors, critical infrastructure sectors in Canada and the 18 in the United States, they, they align very, very well and we know what they are. The 2003 blackout gave us a, a, a great insight to the interoperability and the interdependency, perhaps more important about the and rely, uh, resiliency of, of the bulk power system between you know, looking at uh, across the eastern interconnect, the western Texas uh, by its own at Ercot and, and the province of Quebec, those are the, those are the zones. Um, when you peel back the layers, and I'll, I'll preface this with full disclosure, saying that, that my experience is all about the industrial automation, supervisory control, data acquisition, and the control systems that run the critical infrastructure elements. So when you're talking oil and gas, water, the bulk power system, generation, transportation, uh, the gates, the uh, uh, water leveling systems inside the St. Lawrence Seaway, the mechanisms that sit at ports, which are primary logistics nodes that are very critical to the national, international, binational supply chains. That, that's my world. And my perspective in talking today is coming from doing tactical binational assessments on those critical infrastructure elements from a cyber perspective that span the Canada U.S. regions. Um, I think it's very important to take the elements of fear, uncertainty, and doubt and put it in the context of reality. Uh, information sharing is vital. It is absolutely vital. Uh, we hear concerns about elements such as the bulk power system in the United States versus the bulk power system in Canada. Again, the management function for this is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which has stood up the electric sector information sharing and analysis center, which is accessible to all the NERC registered entities on both sides of the border. And that's where the actionable intelligence comes from and gets infiltrated down through the CSI SAC into the hands of those stakeholders. But we don't have that mechanism per se for the oil and gas sector, for the pipelines, for waterways, and for transportation. But we do have the CSIRC in Canada, which works very, very closely with ICS CERT, the Industrial Control Systems Computer Emergency Response Team, or Cyber Emergency Response Team under DHS, that in those two eyes themselves work incredibly close with the other three eyes for the entire global 5 eye community looking at industrial control systems and cyber threats to critical infrastructure that would be using control systems as a vector. The interesting thing about looking at cyber risk in critical infrastructure from Canada and the U.S., we, we have figured out to look at it together as threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences. And the idea is, as Paul alluded to, working and managing the threat, right? Understanding the vulnerabilities is fine, but the threats and the overall, the risk function goes to zero when the overall threat goes to zero. And threat operates on capability, opportunity, and intent. So we do have the need for national cooperative Canada US intelligence organizations to figure out that trifecta of capability opportunity intent and when it's going to strike to exploit a known vulnerability we look back into certain elements of the world that we saw big big cyber instances like Stuxnet that came out many organizations around the world lived with Stuxnet in their system and didn't do anything about it why because the threat was zero to them that piece of 
technology was written specifically, apparently, for a very specific system. And if you were not the target system, there was really no threat to it, save for the possibility of having a configuration file moved here or two. But lots of people got it, and nobody did anything about it because the threat was zero, and they were told the threat was zero when the tool was, when the malware was reverse engineered. We do have this massive cross-sector dependency, and we need to be able to effectively migrate threat elements and the understanding of threats and vulnerabilities that exist that are concurrent and applicable to all of the sectors. Remember, we have a foundation in the industrial automation that runs our critical infrastructure systems that drives interconnectivity, and we have vulnerabilities that are spread across maybe a finite number of industrial or control system environments. So the vulnerabilities that we see applicable and exploitable to the electric grid can become exploitable in generation, can become exploitable in transportation, in oil and gas, in food, in water, wastewater. So as we talk about information sharing, I think it's really important to understand where we are right now with what's really going on. One of my greatest concerns is that the actual real-time capabilities for joint information sharing between Canada and the United States is not well understood. It has been my experience that that functions fairly well. And there has been a number of notable examples where the U.S. has benefited from information coming from Canada and vice versa. I fully agree with Canada being able to put more money where their mouth is when you have a national cybersecurity strategy that is ponying up cash, which is less than what you could do a startup for in 2012, 2013 on an annual basis, we kind of have to sit back and scratch our heads. We do have a CSERC operation that since the, uh, the hours of operation have been uh, come to light that they're not operating by 24-7, even though there was a 24 by 7 duty operation. It wasn't like you'd phone and get an answering machine. There was a capability to do that absolutely needs to be improved. We have a failure, I think, to appropriately understand transborder equities and the mechanism that needs to be developed to exchange the information to pri prioritize the impact of those equities being compromised and figure out how to get the actionable intelligence to the asset owner, who owns 85 percent of the critical infrastructure anyway, in a manner that they can decide appropriately what needs to be done. We can't force them. We can't create the security and, pol and privacy policies to actually force anybody to do that but we can empower them with the right information in the right way to help them understand the overall probability of the risk from a cyber attack. They're the ones who are going to understand the consequences better than anybody else. So um, that's where I'd like to sort of leave it because I know we have a bunch of other things we wanted to talk about. And certainly I, I agree with Paul in that the, the thrust of this conversation is going to come from some Q&A. Mm. Um, I would like to start uh, the discussion uh, by perhaps going back to what uh, Paul uh, quickly alluded to, uh, predictions. Uh, let's focus on the U.S. for a bit and then perhaps move out to what that would mean uh, for Canada and then, and then globally. So we have a House version, we have a Senate version, we have the executive order, uh, lots of uh, speculations. Um, could you comment on perhaps... Um, on, on each of the differences in those proposals and whether one version or the other you think, in your perspective, um, would be better um, as far as moving forward the, the coordination between the two countries? Well, there's a lot in that question. Uh, I'll start with, with the coordination piece at the end, which was one of the things that I was pleased to see in the, um, I think it was the last version of the Senate bill was actually a provision authorizing the Department of Homeland Security and the Secretary of State to try and do some of the coordination that I'm talking about with foreign governments. Mm -hmm. it, it was at least arguably implicit in broad authorizations generally, but it hadn't been explicit. Um, and it was one of the few criticisms of the bill that, the, that um, my Democrat friends actually took. <laughs> um, but I was glad to see that and, and, and as a recognition of it. Um, you know, uh, the, we've been talking about information sharing, and, and, I, and I would actually, I didn't mean to suggest, Mark, that, that we aren't doing some effective information sharing now, but I, I am worried that as the U.S. builds a government to private sector information sharing system that they'll probably exclude onward transmission of that to uh, non-American uh, private sector actors. So I'm actually worried that the way that, the, that we're going will wind up erecting barriers that will interpose greater 
limitations uh, on the exchange that happens now, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on government-originated information, U.S. government-originated inf information. Um, uh, I saw nothing, for example, in either the House or Senate uh, information sharing uh, titles of their respective bills, CISPA and CSA, that uh, I read as, as allowing uh, the granting of uh, of uh, security clearance, in effect, to Canadian companies uh, or, or Canadian private sector actors. They, it, instead, the model that I think that would have built would have been over the top, you know, U.S. government to Canadian government and then back down, which would break the rather effective existing private to private sector sharing that exists. Um, uh, so that, that, was, that was really more, uh, more of my concern than than the existing structure. And then the last piece, of course, is that only the, um, only the Senate has a, a regulatory provision in its proposals, a standard setting provision. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I, I think that's a, an utterly benighted and, and ill-considered idea, but um, for reasons that involve stifling of innovation and, and unknown costs. But even if we were to go down that road, um, again, I saw nothing in that in those provisions that suggested that Canadian private sector critical infrastructure infrastructure holders would have any say in what those performance standards would be, and then they'd either implicitly be obliged to catch up um, because they wouldn't want to diverge from American standards, or they would diverge, in which case we'd have, there'd be a security gap somewhere. I don't know which side of the border it would have been on. Um, as for predictions, President Obama will issue an executive order before the end of the year, and that will kill the chances for any cybersecurity legislation. Mm -hmm. That's my prediction, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm going to have to uh, agree with Paul with regards to the last point that we, we will expect to see uh, an EO uh, for that. That's the way to go. Uh, the issue from, you know, we had the Senate with the, the, the standards. That is, a, that is a tough call. We, we do know that there are critical infrastructure specific standards in, in uh, well, NERC is an example. Currently mm -hmm. of all the critical sectors, that is really the only one that provisions some sort of cybersecurity. It's not legislation by any stretch, but it is the framework and provisioning through the SIP standards that facilitates the mechanisms for NERC registered entities to be auditably compliant with monetary penalty fines for failures to being cybersecurity compliant in, in certain areas. Um, Canada does not enforce those rules. They, NERC likes them to abide by them. They can be audited, but, but failure of compliance in Canada does not actually generate monetary fines at this, at this point in time. Um, the standards that have been developed in the U.S. as it relates to cybersecurity for many critical infrastructure sectors that influence both Canadian and U.S. equities on both sides of the border the Canadians tend to actually follow that. They, they, can, they, they tend to follow those as whether it's coming out from NIST, the DHS recommended practices for cybersecurity, what comes out from information sharing and things like this. Um, anything that is going to facilitate more actionable information to the stakeholder to make better informed decisions, not actually empower them with information about sources and methods or anything like that, but what the specific information is that allows them to make decisions on how to modify a system to prevent a certain type of adversary operating and exploiting a certain type of vulnerability, uh, I think is very, very important. You know, behind the scenes, the bulk power system has, is, is a funny one, is a funny one because this, this she, and I'll call her she, the, the bulk power system has been exceptionally resilient and has over the years um, suffered many, many different issues, physical, weather, meteorological, um, uh, coronal mass ejection issues, all these kind of things. The relationship in what, you know, people asked uh, a little while ago, we're trying to get their head around the possibility of the FERC to NERC legislation and actually, you know, ordering sectors or asset owners in the bulk power system to, in the, in the face of an imminent cyber attack on the bulk power system, being able to shut down asset owners. Well, how is that going to work in Canada? Um, I believe that although we have some work to do, there are hidden mechanisms in there to the point that threat information, imminent types of attacks would find their way north of the border very quickly, very clearly, and you would see actions taken uh, in an orderly manner to actually fear whether it comes from NERC, whether it comes from FERC or something like that. We have the possibility of tear sheets. We can get the information to these people without them knowing. And I do believe that there is a process like is, like is going on in the United States to get the appropriate asset owners cleared when you're talking about taking it to the level, whether it's 
a FERC clearance NERC or actually looking at 5i community type information, uh, I think that this is inevitable. It's, it's a hard and complex problem to solve. With regards to House or Senate, both had some great ideas. I, I, I agree. I don't think both are going to happen, and you'll see an executive order. We talked about government-originated data and then private sector to private sector um, mm. information sharing. Um, how about information flowing up from the private sector to the government? Because we're hearing some skepticism and some reluctance on the part of the industry uh, to share information uh, because they be, uh, a lot of what we hear from the industry is that they want a safe harbor, right? And, and without safe harbor and without legislation, if all we have is executive order, really what kind of carrot versus stick do we have to get the private sector cooperation both on Canada and in the U.S.? Uh, you, you know, so this is very interesting because we, we do see, we, we are seeing a growth in the strategies for the asset owner to push information up down, you know, so homegrown discovered vulnerabilities, uh, certain types of attacks. Um, it all comes down to uh, attribution, right? I mean, the, the, the number one um, indicator of adversarial activity for the asset owners is going to be either a government organization advising them that this has happened because in the background you have the intelligence community mm -hmm. watching and managing things and having to go to alert the asset owner but you do often see the asset owner going the other way but the issue is is the release of the information how do you do it without attribution how do you actually scope the extent to which the activity is going what does it actually mean um and that's very hard for the asset owners to do that when you are dealing with entities that are publicly traded, that have investment profiles. I mean, the threat of a cyber attack right now, uh, discovering a cyber attack, what does that do to the overall value proposition of the company when you're dealing with the theft of intellectual property or the threat of an adversary taking out the capability for the control system, which is the bread and butter for the system to be taken away as well. Uh, does this actually, if it gets into federal hands, does it become a reporting issue to the SEC? You've experienced a cyber attack which reduced the loss of intellectual property, which reduced the overall competitive market and things like this. So the reticence is driven almost directly by the need for the safe harbor, for zero attribution. Um, I think that that is a very difficult problem for the law enforcement and intelligence communities on both sides of the border to do so, specifically when you're talking about actors who may compromise a critical infrastructure system on one side on one country and begin to influence operations, performance, and economic security of that company in the other country. Well, we're going to have radical agreement throughout this panel. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I advise, in, in my private capacity, I advise corporate clients, and none of them will be aggressive in sharing with the government without a safe harbor. There's liability concerns, there's uh, generating regulation concerns, there's uh, uh, affecting market value concerns, there's disclosure of vulnerability concerns to their competitors for their advantage, uh, and on and on. Um, so I agree with Mark completely, and I would add one other point, which is that um, at least so far, they mostly don't see that much value coming back to them from the government. Um, that, that is to say that the government can sometimes provide new, unique, different sorts of information, both governments, uh, but in general, um, they feel like they're doing pretty darn fine themselves. They're pretty aggressive on their networks, especially the sophisticated actors, people like the Verizons and AT&Ts who, who know a great deal more about what's happening on their networks than they ever tell anybody. Um, so um, they need a, the value proposition is not there for them. Mm -hmm. They're about making money and, you know, and they're, they're capable of, of, uh, second, of analyzing second order effects. If I give this, I'll get that. And they don't see the get either. So uh, between the two of those things, uh, I think there's uh, limited uh, prospects for that. And, you know, just to follow on the theme, again, uh, it, this will become even more complicated if, if, a, if a, an American bank thinks that its information is going to be shared with the Canadian um, financial regulatory uh, system because, you know, a Canadian bank might have the same sets of vulnerabilities. I, I just wanted to say, and on that, I mean, we do have the, the foundations for that information sharing process is there. All the sectors have their respective 
information sharing and analysis centers. There's an ESI SAC for the energy sector. There's a financial one. There's a water one. There's telecommunication. They're, they're all there. The issue in getting the, the issue lies in the anonymity and being able to post and share information in there without any attribution, because there is so much required attribution to become enrolled in the process for information sharing itself. We are lacking the mechanism to, and th this is not to say for the very, very savvy, forward-leaning, security-centric industrial entity, critical infrastructure entity, there are methods to go through with law enforcement, with intelligence, with the, with, you know, NERC as an example, to get the pertinent need to know information out there. We have seen strides made where information will be shared more readily on the condition that it stays within the sector itself. You know, water issues going to water, but the information going up to trans-border Canadian U.S. intelligence communities to try and extrapolate the actual influence of the vulnerability or the incident across sector as it relates to binational infrastructures is something that we, we absolutely need to address at a different level. So you're all probably figuring out, like, what am I doing here? But I actually have a, a perfect slide that, you know, that it's not often that you actually have it on your, mm -hmm. how do I get to my, to the computer? The network, is that it? No. I, I, I just put my thumb drive in and I want to get to the thumb drive. Um, it, uh, it, no, it didn't show up. Yeah, well, maybe I'll. Uh, hit the Microsoft E, hit the yeah. E. Yeah, no, it's just, I, it's not often that you actually have the slide you want with you. Uh, Let's try open and see if it shows up that way. There. There we go. It happens to, I, I, I did this in my lecture just the other day, and that's the slide, and there we go uh, from the current slide. Nice. I just thought I'd share this because we talk about all the information sharing. That's a slide that one of my students put together a couple of years ago of all the different uh, information sharing um, uh, entities in the United States doesn't even have Canada in it or any other government. Um, and I confess that when she put this together, there are several of them that I, I just actually don't even know the acronyms for. Um, so while I agree that we have the infrastructure there, I would submit we need to simplify it. Um, I, 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 I concur with that and, and, and the, the the foundation of standing all of these up is each one of the sectors in themselves recognizing the need to have their own ISAC. So mm. that's down here in, in this corner. <laughs> Those are all the ISACs. Let's, let's continue on that point for uh, a little bit more. You so if, uh, your if you, you are distinguishing sector to sector, does it make sense to have different standards, different information sharing requirements, say from water to, to energy to, to the banks, financial industry? Uh, well, no, that's a really good question. I, I don't think there needs to be a deviation from a framework for how the information is, is exchanged. I think that there needs to be consideration for the type of information that's actually going to be uh, exchanged. We need, to, we need to be able to effectively carve out the most salient elements of the information that needs to be shared as it relates from sector to sector. Not how it's shared, but the actual information that is shared. Because again, we, are, we, we want to understand binational consequences as it relates to national and economic security for that. So although I, I, I don't think the issue is, is how the information is shared, the, the granularity and the type of information is, is where we need to get. And, and, it, and it's interesting because we get back to the issue that, that Paul raised, is that that granularity uh, downstream from the intelligence community gets very, very difficult. And, and uh, going upstream, there has to be a value proposition for the asset owner themselves to want to share that information. So I agree with that. And I would add one thing. Um, I, I agree that the framework is there. I think another thing that that is probably a near-term, relatively easy pro uh, project, joint project, is um, a baseline, um, which is to say that I started this talk by giving you the results of my modest efforts to do research on the different types of uh, infrastructure that are interconnected that I have to discern have cyber connections between them that seem relevant. But I confess that my, my survey was up at this level, right? Uh, the electric grid and the cyber connections, but not any further down. It would be of great value I think, for 
uh, uh, some form of joint project between the two countries to really dig down because that will tell you which systems require more deeper information sharing across the border and which ones maybe in that, that I've um, identified have less. I mean, for all I know, the stock exchange link can be cut mm. readily and doesn't actually transmit data. But, uh, you know, uh, my, my level of detail in examine, examining that was just enough to get me into this room, <laughs> but not enough to actually write a, an operational plan. Right. I, that 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 is a that is a great point. There, the, the United States has done an exceptional job of determining from the, the CIKR effort, critical infrastructure, key resource, right? Being able to tag and recognize what those actually are. And Canada is going through the process of recognizing those. What what we expect is to understand what we expect, or what we'd like to think and hope which we might make it easier, is to find considerable interdependency between the CIKR elements in the U.S. and in Canada, whether they might even be the same company, they will be using the same backbone, backhaul mechanism for communications. That will facilitate a better understanding of the single points of weakness and addressing the, uh, the, the, the contextual information from the intelligence communities on both sides to look at and develop things like attack trees, looking at those common elements, and then look at the, you know, the leafs and the nodes and look at countermeasures, proactive countermeasures for that. Of course, what that does suggest, um, uh, and, and I guess this is my meta point, is we got to do it together. Yes. Right? I mean, this isn't, I, I, that, that as well is, is, is basically a fundamentally shared services model can't be achieved by the U.S. looking at its side, Canada looking at its side, and kind of comparing notes at the top and in the end. Um, uh, that just wouldn't be terribly effective. Le leadership in Ottawa and Washington post-election, and we talked about this outside, need to immediately revisit the momentum that was established in the Beyond the Borders thing and include this cyber element to that. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. We know from real, wor real world experience is that at the day-to-day -day operations, we, we do see this, is, you know, some of it is not necessarily fully sanctioned, but it just needs to get done. You know, law enforcement talking to law enforcement, certs talking to certs, this gets done. I'm unaware of whether or not the importance of the issue and how it can be rectified is truly resonating at the highest levels possible. On a day-to-day -day basis, we can see things that actually work. We need more senior buy-in and economic buy-in from Canada to, to fuel this process, harvest what we know which has had worked, and immediately address some of the more uh, uh, pertinent issues that we've discussed here. Because there are elements that are working. We see it on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of stuff that could have happened that didn't because of the information sharing and the countermeasures that were in place and the tactical proactive or reactive response. But looking at grid elements, I mean, we, we don't have to think too hard in our mind's eye to figure out some worst-case scenarios that which we once thought weren't real could actually be plausible because we continue to exercise them on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's also uh, think about the role that the military plays uh, versus the civilian agencies. Um, U.S. Secretary uh, of Defense Leon Panetta authorized this year Joint Cyber uh, Center. And um, what does that mean to have the JCC at each geographic command uh, in terms of standardizing cyber operations and um, its role vis-a-vis -vis the civilian agencies? I don't think we know yet um, is the best answer. Uh, I mean, consistent with, with the point I've been making for the private sector, I think that joint cyber operations are probably almost essential in s to some degree. Um, uh, I don't think, you know, when, we, when you get to defense, neither country will ever give up its own right to freedom of action. Uh, in determining what it has to do for its own defense in cyberspace any more than they would in, you know, the maritime domain or any other domain. But, um, but uh, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's just as it's absolutely certain that a nuclear weapon exploding in Buffalo would have cross-border effects, um, it's equally certain that an electric grid failure in Buffalo would have those cross-border effects, and potentially, if that were an attack from a nation state, um, you know, militarized cross-border effects. It is, um, the two countries are inextricably linked. Uh, that's, uh, to my mind, um, 
the hardest part about those kinds of joint operations in the military domain are going to be reaching common understandings of um, uh, acceptable offensive behaviors, acceptable defensive behaviors, and uh, on both sides of the border, I think a really tough nut to crack is uh, the role of the military in defending civilian networks, mm -hmm. um, which uh, has uh, salience here in the United States uh, that give, gives people heebie-jeebies and though I haven't seen the question talked about much in Canada, I would have to imagine it would raise even greater hackles uh, amongst Canadians in some ways because of their heightened sense of privacy concerns mm -hmm. and things like that. But that's a bit speculative on my part because I actually haven't seen it discussed. No, I, I, you know, we, we don't know yet, but we, we, we have to bear in mind that uh, in both countries, in the U.S. and Canada, when we look at cyber as a element of signals. It is, it is signals. Uh, the agencies responsible for signals collection, intelligence, and analysis technically de are defined by defense functions. Right. So that being said, the people who are responsible to actually watching signals, uh, i.e. cyber traffic, fall under uh, defense. But, but we can't forget that in Canada and the United States, clearly, we, we really can't lose focus of the fact that the influence of critical infrastructure for effective operations for military in country Right. If something were to happen for defensive, I don't I don't care what it is, but it is not possible for a military in either Canada, the U.S. or any country for that matter to fully function without critical infrastructure working. And when you look at the interdependency and interoperability charts that we see of the influence of energy on water, on transportation, on oil and gas, on health and human services and things like that, the failure or catastrophic failure of things like the power failure and the influence on the other sectors, it gets very, very ugly very, very fast. There's been numerous great studies done on the economic analysis of what happens in the United States or, and or Canada or both of them with the failure of the bulk power system and extrapolating what it means. Bringing the military in, there, I think it's two-pronged for that, and yet we have to see what's going on. They're responsible for doing very, very good signals. I do believe we need to do a better job at educating those organizations and agencies what they actually mean from a critical infrastructure perspective, but we also can't lose focus, uh, focus on the fact that vital national military operations uh, at, at war or at peace depend on effective, fully functioning critical infrastructures. And those critical infrastructures in Canada and the U.S., they, we actually depend on each other. So. Pulling back maybe even uh, further, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience here. Security from all threats, including cyber, are, are global, as we talked about. Everything is interconnected. For those of us that do not live and breathe um, cyber um, every day, could you really uh, explain in concrete terms why should we care about cyber attacks? Um, how are cyber attacks perhaps different from physical attacks? Um, well, the, well depending, when you talk about critical infrastructure, I mean, the, the most attractive thing, and in my world, in, in, uh, I've said this many times before, the most attractive thing about cyber attacks on critical infrastructure systems is that keystrokes manifest as real-world kinetic impact events, right? You can cause systemic device level, field level, systemic damage to systems through cyber attack. Everybody saw the Aurora video when it, when it came out. And you actually looked at the influence of cyber on real physical systems. The advantage is, is pretty clear. You have no attribution or zero attribution, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, the uh, cost is traditionally uh, going to be significantly less. Mm -hmm. uh, and I talked about no attribution. We also talk about reattribution, right? You can either blame yourself, blame somebody else, or blame mm -hmm. nobody. Um, there's repeatability. There's repeatability. There's the, the uh, aspects of the first round of attack, which is going to be target selection and reconnaissance. Reconnaissance can go on for a very long time and almost go undetected because the rate of change inside critical, critical infrastructure elements is so slow. The reconnaissance process can take a very, very long time knowing that the system is going to be very much the same two years after the beginning of the observation as, as the first day. Uh, and repeatability is, is, is very, very important. If you get it wrong the first time, you can try again, uh, unless you're a, a terrible suicide bomber. Seriously, uh, you really only get one shot at <laughs> doing it. Um, so there's a number of different factors out there on that. So. Um, I'm going to actually ask a question. Has everybody, when he said everybody's seen the Aurora video, I actually, 
have it here. Who who has not seen? Raise your hand if you've not seen the Aurora video. I'm going to do that rather than <laughs> rather than do my you know. This is this is the great thing about having um, uh, having uh, your thumb drive with you uh, at all times. Where's my uh, Windows Explorer here? I hate Windows, you know. <laughs> I really do. Uh, continue without scanning. <laughs> So, no virus scans. <laughs> uh, I, I want. I want to. I want to get to the. Uh, to to my pat my. Yeah, pull it up. Just want to be able to see. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, we see there. Where's my? Where's the computer? There we go. Bingo. Okay, this. I. I hope you have. Uh, uh, yeah. This is, the Aurora video. From CNN, that's a diesel generator of the sort uh, used in many electric generation facilities around the country. Uh, this is a test that the Department of Homeland Security did at the Idaho National Labs in 2007, was it, or eight? In any event, um, nobody's touching this, right? Nobody's physically touching it at all. Uh, the uh, National Lab guys uh, imported a virus in that ordered the uh, diesel generator to essentially uh, change its... Uh, it's electrical uh, uh, frequency or something like that. That's not how it's supposed to run, guys, mm. right? They made it run itself to death, and that's the end of the story right there. Uh, basically taken offline at a distance uh, without hands-on, keystrokes having real-world field physical effects. Um, so when you ask, why should we care um, about cyber, you know, everybody in the room should care about cyber because of, you know, losing money or, you know, cyber theft and stuff like that. Both countries should care about things like massive Chinese cyber espionage that is stealing, um, uh, you know, the, the plans to the F-35 out of the Pentagon. Um, you know, so I was reading the other day, the estimate of the volume of information that has been stolen that is intellectual property from the United States if it were a series of trucks filled with paper, would stretch from the Pentagon to the port in Baltimore. So if we saw the Chinese actually pulling up that many trucks to the Pentagon, wouldn't we actually kind of notice? Um, and, and now we're sort of not noticing. So those are, but those are really at government level or at personal level effects. The one that's going to really um, freak people out and blow people's minds is not the, st the theft of bits and bytes of information about you. It's breaking stuff in the real world, whether it's the diesel generator or um, I was reading, and, and I'll end here, I was reading the other day about a hack that changes an insulin pump, an, in, uh, an implanted insulin pump that communicates by Wi-Fi. We put the pump in and it communicates by Wi-Fi because you don't want to open it up every time you want to change the dosage. Diabetics want to adjust their dosage and they can do so with an external control monitor. That system can, have, uh, uh, some researchers in Carnegie Mellon, I think, demonstrated that they could hack into that system and assassinate somebody, mm. <laughs> but, you know, if they wanted to. So that kind of real-world effect of keystrokes is what really uh, is changing the game. I'm sorry I keep messing up with your, your program there. <laughs> All right, on that note, that cyber is just as real as war on the ground, um, I would like to open up for questions. And please uh, identify yourself, uh, name, and affiliation. Um, if nobody jumps on it, I got more questions. <laughs> All right, right there. Hi there. It's on. Hello. Uh, Teresa Brown, Cardinal North Strategies. So. Um, cyber was included in the U.S.-Canada Beyond the Border uh, Declaration and Action Plan at a pretty high level. And in October, uh, the two countries issued their Cybersecurity Action Plan, um, all of four pages. Mm -hmm. uh, four pages, and uh, it included such, such, such wonderful things as conducting joint briefings and con coordinating on uh, materials and communication strategies, all of which sounds very nice and fluffy and doesn't get nearly close to the level of information sharing that you are talking about. So uh, my question is, what do you think needs to be done to move that process? Who are the right players? Wh are there, maybe there's more going on that they're not putting in the four-page document. I believe that's probably true. Um, but it seems to me that there's a much deeper level that needs to be addressed. 
uh, in terms of real-time information sharing, in terms of addressing the legal and policy frameworks that, that you suggested. The United States is going through a bunch of uh, our, our usual rigmarole around trying to get cybersecurity legislation passed. What's the framework in Canada like for those same issues? Are they compatible? Is there one? Um, if we pass legislation, what then happens in Canada if we're talking about cross-border issues? So your comments on that, please. All right, so you can start. Yeah, there yeah. are many questions in that, so. <laughs> yeah, four, four pages that, uh, the, the four pages nicely wrote up things that are uh, really already happening. So that's, that's great, sort of like a big after-action report. But going forward, the, this, I'm going to leave the second part of the question to, to, to Paul. The, and, and coming from the assessment world, looking at, and, and I guess the answer is actually lies in the assessment world. It is not difficult for Canada and U.S. together to look at national equities or national elements that have equities to both countries from a critical infrastructure key resource perspective. The capabilities with the best minds in both countries to go out and assess these systems from the threat of cyber risk, looking at vulnerabilities, looking at consequence, and then behind the scenes looking at the applicability of threat, that capability is there to do that. DHS has created libraries and self-assessment tools to actually empower asset owners to do this. Not U.S. asset owners. There's technology that DHS has created through the Control System Security Program that entities can take to look at how to address the cybersecurity profiles of their industrial automation or their control systems. And again, when we're talking about cybersecurity and critical infrastructure, we're actually talking about the technology that drives it. Control systems, SCADA systems, energy management systems. The ability to appropriately assess those to determine the security risk profile is is there. So obviously when you look at next steps for the beyond the, the beyond the borders and the security action plans, we need to see tandem joint assessments between Canada and the US looking at going and having Canadian and US teams through Public Safety Canada or the Department of Homeland Security look at those critical infrastructure key resource assets and do the binational combined cyber threat assessment on them. I understand wholeheartedly that you would have, both in Canada and the U.S., asset owners slightly reticent because of the privacy issues for that. But when you're talking about the, I believe when you're talking about the assets themselves that are in the CIKR, you're looking at some pretty large and important companies that will probably be able to lean a little more forward to see those activities done. The information that is going to come from those types of assessments can absolutely be extrapolated to the smaller entities. And again, if we use the bulk power example as, 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 a, um, as an example here, we need to learn the cybersecurity intelligence about large scale, ent scale entities and map them down to the smaller entities because we are talking about the bulk power system and even though a company might be running with two or three people, they still provide electronic and cyber accessibility to the bulk power system. So what we can figure out from the CIKR perspective through joint assessment processes can absolutely be extrapolated into the other elements across all of the 10 sectors in Canada and the subsequent 18 in the United States. And I actually don't remember the other part of the question, and I'm sorry. And that's why I passed it to Paul. Yeah, no, but I didn't either. So I'm just going to talk <laughs> about it. Talk whatever I want. What was the other half of the question? The question was, regardless of the outcome of the cybersecurity debate with the United States, does Canada have similar frameworks for Oh, I'm not the right person to answer that question. I'm not the Canadian. Um, but I'll, I'll answer the first part or a different way, your, the first part of your question, which is how do we get it done? Um, if I were uh, if I were really grading um, the four page BTB cyber strategy, I'd give it a D minus, right? It was an agreement to be nice and not much more. Um, you know, you can identify a half dozen work streams uh, right now. Uh, that you want to, whether it's coordination of approaches in the international sphere to forestall um, uh, authoritarian countries from taking over internet governance, which would have some major effects on uh, cyber threats and cybersecurity, or uh, enhanced information sharing from the CIC, CCIRC, CCIRC, uh, CCIRC. CCIRC. Um, to, to U.S. CERT. Um, 
right, a, a, on a real-time basis, you know, and building that out, whether it's uh, the development of joint cyber combat doctrine uh, between uh, U.S. Cyber Command and the Canadian military, whether it's the joint assessments uh, that Mark just talked about, which are a fantastic idea, whether it's the baselining uh, idea of, of interoperability that I talked about, uh, all those are perfectly sensible uh, and, and feasible goals that ought to be on a, a, uh, a joint plate. Um, if you want to know how to do it, you know, uh, we, you actually set it out in the, in the hall this morning uh, when we were coming in. The president and the prime minister need to get together and say, we want you to do this. And no, no, we really want you to do this. And this in particular, right, I, I think that the lead in the United States is going to have to come through the cyber czar and the NSC and bringing um, the uh, department, uh, uh, DHS's, uh, 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 you know, uh, NPPD directorate into it. Um, you know, it will be Public Safety Canada, and I don't know who in the in the prime minister's office runs this. I'm not as familiar with the Canadian side, but I actually think, you know, and and forgive me for for saying this, but I actually think this is a bigger deal than all the other BTB things out there in a lot of ways, because if we get this one wrong, all the border security in the world comes crashing down. All the trade facilitation in the world comes crashing down. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not one who actually over magnifies the cyber threat. I tend to think that we run around with a little bit of our hair on fire when we talk about cyber Pearl Harbor. But for gosh sakes, we can't ignore it either. And four pages of fluff is the moral equivalent of ignoring it. Let me let me just add add one thing to that. I mean, we are we are we are talking about the, the the strategies and the politics associated with trying to solve this. Uh, the beyond the border, it talks about methodologies, processes, information sharing. We we have to remember that, and and I hate citing this number, but we have a, a huge percentage of both national infrastructures owned by private sector. And while we are running around as the U.S. and Canada, Canadian governments and the U.S. government saying, this is how we're going to fix it, this is what we're going to do, we, we still have, the, the governments have apparently failed in managing the outreach campaigns to manage the cultural issues for that. Right? Half the time when you're actually talking about the capabilities of CSERC and ICS CERT, which do communicate on a very regular basis as it relates to threats and vulnerabilities and consequences, and they have been fully trained in, that's a phone ringing, that's fantastic. Uh, they have been fully trained in understanding cybersecurity issues and the impacts to critical infrastructure for things like control systems. The asset owners themselves either don't know the capability exists to talk to them or are unaware basically on what to do in the event that you have some sort of cyber specific incident that relates to a critical infrastructure element to that. We need to be able to make sure that the funding, and again, Canada needs to do a better job at paying for that outreach campaign. DHS does a very good job at doing it, and that's why you have to see a huge uptick on the U.S. side from critical infrastructure asset owners trying to see where do I get more information, how do I access the libraries, who, what is this, what is the technology I can use to assess myself, who can I speak to within DHS. Canada does need to do a better job at reaching out, and they've started to do that, but there is a huge cultural component that needs to be part of that in the campaign to educate the actual people who own and run the systems. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to make a call, please hang up. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave... <laughs> it's you. Unplug it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the phone, I'm afraid. It's up there. So clever. Uh, I'm Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, a point that's been made uh, a few times but uh, doesn't seem to be really stressed is that this is not a question of two countries competing. The grid is composed of a whole bunch of private entities who are competing with each other. Right. And yet, in spite of that, they've actually managed to put together something that works pretty well. And it's hard to imagine, except for specific threats against specific physical sites, how you could implement, how any company could implement any uh, counter to a perceived cyber threat without, implement, without basically involving the entire grid. And the question is, do we really need another layer of management, or can this all be handled through the current grid management, which seems to be doing a reasonably good job? 
I, I can I concur with you. I mean, in terms of grid, we'll talk about grid. Uh, NERC is doing a good job at this. And, the, and let's also give credit to there's NERC. There's also the asset owners themselves. Yes, they are in competition with each other, but they know if one of the peers, upstream or downstream, start to fall off, they get into trouble e economically. So yes, there's competition, but the healthy competition and the revenue is directly proportional to your peers working, and you need to support that. The resiliency of the bulk power system has always been on the, the t and I have seen some amazing things go on to maintain the lights staying on for that. I'm not sure we need another layer of management for that. I think that the, I think that the electric sector by itself could, by example, dictate to the other sectors what could be done. And we have seen this from a cybersecurity perspective. We have gone and looked at other sectors looking at the NERC SIP standards and the principles about building electronic security perimeters, defense in depth, six walled boxes, intrusion prevention systems for the recognition of critical cyber assets. We have seen other sector asset owners look at those fundamental steps in securing their critical systems and saying, how, did this, how does that apply to me? So, um, Great question. It's a great sector to study. I don't think we need more management. I think that um, the process that's in play right now for that particular sector, and this is very good because you have both Canada and U.S. buy-in for these procedures and for compliance to these standards. Um, it's, it's a great example, and, I, and I, uh, I don't think we need more management. But as we go through the revisions of these SIP standards, they begin to move away from almost a voluntary, theoretical, best practice idea into fully enforceable, less wiggle room for the asset owner to get more, to get more secure. Sorry? May not be the best direction. It, it, well, I mean, there's a lot of people. There's people that sit on the fence. There's people that say it's not the best direction because it could be paperwork, but yet time and time again, we see real evidence of it working, of it defending, of it, you know, there is effort in doing it, there is cost in doing it, but it has in many cases actually proven to be very, very effective for organizations. But NERC also at the same time doesn't just take your word for it, they do audit and they do offer the opportunity to go and exercise against it. So you can actually see the fruits of your labor for that and more often than not, the asset owners in the US and Canada are, are pleased with what they've done. Your point's a good one, um, which is to say that the electric grid is better off than most of the other uh, most of the other sectors. Uh, at least one point to be made, though, is that that's not the only sector we care about. I mean, it, it is at the height of everybody's concern because it seems to be the one that everybody talks about and because we have a great video of it. Um, but um, there's a lot of room to be done to re even just to reach that standard for the transportation grid, for uh, the oil and gas pipeline people. You know, they're all not at the same level. Uh, that's the first point. And the second point is that um, I would say from, from, the, from, the, from the clientele that I work with that even though there's a, 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 a reasonable degree of, of, uh, of information sharing going on, uh, particularly as to uh, threats, that there's still some reluctance that needs to be overcome with greater information sharing about vulnerabilities, uh, which we can foster. And then the third point I would make is that um, your perception that the energy sector, the electric grid sector, is doing a good job is actually precisely why I think that the federal government should get out of the business of setting new standards. So I actually distinguish between information sharing, which I think can be fostered, and we you can never have too much of it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, regulatory standards or performance standards – Clearly, in the grid sector, we've probably done enough. Financial sector is really good as well. Uh, uh, water treatment facilities, not so good. You know, I but, mean, but there have been a couple of examples where you have seen federal involvement through incentivization. I mean, you look at the ARRI funds mm -hmm. that were available through DOE through the Smart Grid Act, right? I mean, you had proactively companies and vendors and asset owners coming forward to claim a piece of the multi-billion dollars available to go and procure and roll out smart grid solutions. The, the condition on getting that money and keeping the money was, of course, to ensure embedded security countermeasures for resiliency, capability, longevity, 
which DOE continues to, to check on. They continue to go and look at these. Tomorrow you have the DOE Cyber, Smart Grid Cybersecurity Information Exchange, which is happening here in town, which is the annual revisitation where all the asset owners and vendors get together to talk about what's happening for that. That's but one example. Is, isn't that a great history. example, though? I mean, the Inspector General was up in front of Congress. DOE's sure. Inspector General was up in front of Congress, I don't know, three, four months ago, and he, he gave... You know, at best, I would say a, a B minus. Uh, you know, he said fully one third of the of the smart grid implementation didn't have adequate security stuff in it. So, you know, I mean, it's it's an ongoing process. I'm not critiquing. I'm just saying, you know. Uh, but we have to look at that in terms of progress, because someone oh, who's yes. been in the field doing the assessments, for someone to say, you know, one third of all the smart grid equipment doesn't have any security in it, right? Well, two years ago, it was two thirds have none. Or more than two thirds, perhaps three quarters don't. So over a 12 to 24, maybe a 36 month period to actually start to watch this turn, pushing the burden of responsibility of security being given to the vendor. So it's in the security, it's in the life cycle of the actual product, which aids the procurement process for the actual asset owners to ease the pain associated with deploying secure systems. I'll take one third over, no, one third no over two thirds no security any, any day. Not that I'm saying it's perfect, of course it's not, but I mean, we, it's, it's progress. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sam Rodebush with MITRE Corporation. I'd like to just ask a quick question. You know, you were talking about, we don't need any more standards, um, and I've heard a lot about regulations, but I haven't heard anything about maturity, you know, capability maturity. Uh -huh. Now I know that you were just talking about DOE and some of the good things they've done, and one of the good things they did, and I think you're all aware of it, is the uh, energy sector, uh, C2M2, right, the Cyber Capability mm -hmm. Maturity Model. So, and that was a consortium of private sector and public sector folks that worked together, both administration and, and federal agency and private, uh, to create this uh, sort of model. And it's not the end model. They all agreed that it was sort of the starting model. But what about using that kind of, you know, incentivizing the use of that model? How would you do it? How would you propose that that get done so that it isn't just a good idea? Right. So, do you want? You can go. So the C2M2, the C2M2 model that uh, came out of DOE, from, from the White House and DOE to actually make this, was driven basically by needing to understand what the security risk profile is for the electric sector. How do you do that? And what makes this so interesting is that the energy sector, the electric sector, is actually perfect for that because of the aggregate levels of interest in buy-in that you're going to have from the stakeholders as well. I mean, they're already conversing. They're already sharing these ideas, and they already have some capability through uh, NERC or through some other elements to go and measure profile, not with probability of attacks, but be able to actually specify what the metrics are going to be based on certain parameters for an operational environment, which is fairly ubiquitous across a whole bunch of these different asset owners. So it's, abs it's, it's perfect. I'm a fan of C2M2 for what it's going to be able to provide us in terms of having give us a fairly good cognitive operating picture of what the security is of the bulk power system, but perhaps more importantly, what those that are not as mature need to do to get to a state of better maturity, which is repeatable and measurable. There is nothing bad about that, and it could be used for every sector. I would expect that it would be perfect for water. Right? When we think about cybersecurity and critical infrastructure, the bulk power system has been involved in cybersecurity for a long time. But when it comes about standards, creating technologies to assess cybersecurity profiles for mission critical systems, water sector, AWWA and AWWRF, were actually the forefront leaders in trying to figure out what those security profiles are, and they now have their water sector cybersecurity roadmap and things like this. I see it fully capable to be extracted out to uh, the other sectors to do that. But the success is directly proportional in getting buy-in from the asset owners to want to go through the involvement of developing the model, refining the model, and be measured. The trick is being able to measure, and that involves, getting back to our first point, what does the government do to politely go and extract the intelligence from that infrastructure element to fully understand what the maturity is? And then the question of incentivizing their adoption, do I need to say it again? The question of, of incentivizing their adoption, because what you said is, yes, you get them to buy in, and then what is the incentive to allow that information to be shared, you know, to provide that to right. the, the, 
their peers, the federal government, and so forth. Well, well, the the, the payoff, the, the payoff, uh, the, the short term payoff, obviously, is that what you get as an investor into the model back is an, is information that's going to make you better and safer. Figure out how you. Well, there's one thing. It's like, how do I, on the grand scheme of things, how do I score? Everybody likes to be scored. How do I rate? But what can I get from the model to empower me to be more secure? And how can I be better at empowering my peers? In the electric sector, we talked about this. Your peers depend on being better. The better your peers are, the better you are for profitability. So it's really a, an equal give and take. It may be harder to sell that into some of the other sectors like, you know, critical manufacturing or or food and beverage or something like that. But um, incentivization is, I think, going to be easiest in the electric sector, more difficult in the others. I'll offer just one additional thought. Liability protection. At some point, if you can, you know, uh, prevent yourself from having adverse consequences by achieving a certain level of maturity, um, that'll be a powerful incentive to, uh, uh, to get with the program. I, I'm assuming here that we're going to develop eventually a liability regime for cybersecurity failures. I see the hints of that already in a lot of the litigation that's going on, and I think it's coming down the road. And this would be a way of both measuring uh, getting liability protection or alternatively, um, you know, insurance, uh, right? You know, you, you do better on this, on the, on the test, you get a lower rate of insurance, you pay less money, you know, everything's much better for you because it all comes down to cash, right? Everything in business comes down to that. So I want to find a financial incentive. That's, that's a bit more speculative and down the line than just self-improvement and the, and the joy of being good and scoring well. But I think in the long run, liability protection will actually, you know, be a good incentive of some sort. Oh, hi, Louisa Savage from McLean's Magazine. I apologize if you addressed this earlier because I missed the beginning, but when I think of cyber attacks, I think of Stuxnet and the Iranian reactors, and I'm wondering, has there been any attempted attack in the U.S. or Canada that we know of or don't know of but happened? Or You mean of critical infrastructure? Of critical infrastructure. I'm talking about corporate, but on something that we're talking about protecting critical infrastructure here. Is there a sense that this is a threat that someone's out there working on it or has attempted to, to do something of this nature? It depends how you characterize it, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, about a month ago, uh, most of the major banks in the United States had uh, distributed denial of service attacks. It wasn't, um, it wasn't an infrastructure a uh, destructive attack of the same sort, but it was highly disruptive of business. Um, and, um, you know, one of my clients was spending eight figures in response, you know. Uh, so so, so uh, quite significant in terms of financial damage just from that. Um, I, I, all I know is what I read in the papers, but it's been attributed to Iran as a potential response to Stuxnet. Um, that has less of a tinge of, of, you know, hard physical damage than it does of kind of cyber vandalism or, you know, it's bigger than vandalism, but kind of drive-by shooting or something like that. Um, so that would be one possibility. Um, I'm unaware of, I, uh, well, I am also aware that the people at the NERC, uh, 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 cyber Response Center uh, basically are busy 24-7 uh, addressing threats that they see coming across their networks. Um, whether all of those are intended to have catastrophic physical effects or not is is a very different question because they don't know and because you don't know until the payload actually executes. But there's a high degree of activity on the network um, on a daily basis uh, that uh, is at least potentially Catastrophic. You got more you want to add? Okay. Well, I mean, without being rude, this this isn't the forum to go into what we know or what we don't know. But um, I, I would clearly, I mean, the amount of open source information that is related to cyber specific incidents on critical infrastructure is all over through open source. Uh, if you know where to look through it, so various search engines, circuit that you you can find instances of. Uh, 
not details of attacks, but you could hear about different types of campaigns, concerns from certain sectors. We know that there have been historical individual attacks on critical infrastructure elements. It goes back to the early 2000s with Maruchi Shire in Australia, where the disgruntled employer gets into the, you know, makes himself a, a part of the SCADA system to impact the uh, water filtration and the pumping systems in Australia. We saw an incident with the Huntington Beach, where a uh, someone hacked in and, and turned off the um, uh, leak detection systems for offshore, offshore uh, welling. Uh, we've seen there are numerous uh, FBI cases where they've addressed hackers that have gone after the impact critical infrastructure sectors. Um, I, I think it's safe to assume that there have been and continue to be and will be active cyber campaigns against critical infrastructure elements, whether it is for the extraction of intellectual property, whether it's the development of certain target folders for certain strikes, I, I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say. But I think that with all we know about the vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure systems, the interdependency um, to sit here and say, have any attacks ever happened? Um, I'm sure they, they have. Have we seen them all? I don't know. Have we seen some? Probably. But I think that uh, with a little bit of digging, you could probably find some reasonably good information about some of the more interesting ones that have happened in the past. In other words, beyond hypothetical. Beyond hypothetical? Yeah, we, it's no good to spend time with hypo Well, actually, that's not true. It is good to spend time with hypothetical sometimes because it gets you way out of the box to try and perform it. And in the world of cyber, we're quickly believing, well, if you can't actually do this in theory, try and reproduce it in production or laboratory environment environments, then it's something to be concerned of. Because, you know, there was a day when Stuxnet was only theoretical. But, I mean, it, it was plausible. You could do it. But the level of effort involved in trying to do something, that would assumably be substantial. And it happened. Right. And now the uptick in research, cybersecurity research specific for the systems that run critical infrastructure is scaling up almost logarithmically. You can go to the DHS control system security program. You can subscribe for the weekly reports or the monthly reports. You can look at vulnerability trending and analysis. You can get all this information online and actually see what's happened over the last 12 to 24 months as it relates to the systems that impact critical infrastructure. From there, you could probably extrapolate what people could be doing with that kind of information. So. Are, are you limiting your question to successful, publicly acknowledged attacks that have had destructive impact on American or Canadian infrastructure? I'm just wondering. I mean, because that's a, that's a much narrower thing. I mean, what Mark and I are both talking about. Where we are about, on the scale of well, this is a hypothetical threat versus this happened last week, you know, just trying to understand. There have been fewer things that we could, there have been fewer things that we could talk about in America or Canada, in part because we're, we're good. I, I mean, another one would be the Shamoon um, attack on Aramco, Saudi Aramco, which destroyed 30,000 computers. I mean, just destroyed them. I mean, you, you're talking real world physical effects, wiping out 30,000 computers and all the data and programming on them is pretty darn real. Um, that one was also allegedly attributed to Iran. Um, whether it was or not, who knows. Uh, and, and, and if you want documented uh, espionage, in, intel, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, intellectual property theft programs, you know, the, the list of Chinese, Russian, uh, Israeli, German, French, English, uh, and, and American, I might add, you know, but not in America, you know, programs that are doing that in, in open source is, is longer than my arm. Um, uh, highly destructive, successfully destructive U.S. infrastructure programs, thankfully not yet, I think. My name is Jason Strickland, uh, and I am with the NORAD NORTHCOM uh, Joint Cyber Center. So I uh, appreciate you mentioning that in your, in, as you were beginning the discussion. Um, Paul, you mentioned uh, the role of the military. Uh, or she what asked is about the, it. Yeah. <laughs> what, is the, what do you believe the role of the military may be in protecting uh, civilian networks? And I'd submit uh, that uh, within NORAD Nor and U.S. NORTHCOM, uh, we've expanded our roles, uh, beginning with just a, a primarily an air domain threat for the binateral, uh, uh, the agreement between the two countries, expanding that into uh, a maritime role now, and then as well, we've included that in the cyber role as well. Uh, and within critical infrastructure and key resources within 
the Department of Defense, we look at the defense industrial base, bringing in our private sector partners to be able to uh, protect them to a degree and to keep their interests in mind. So I'd like just to give you the opportunity to perhaps expand on that, and, and you as well, Mark, in, in the role for the military in a similar vein, the way we're working with the defense industrial base to protect their critical infrastructure or keep tabs appropriately to secure our national power? Uh, that's a, a great question. I'll, I'll make two responses. Uh, the first is I was at a conference at the Naval Academy um, three, four weeks ago with the deputy commander of NORTHCOM and the deputy commander of, or the number three at Cyber Command. <coughs> and they were still discussing and hadn't yet agreed upon what the lanes in the road were between the two of them for protecting American critical infrastructure. NORTHCOM's got the Homeland Defense Mission, CyberCom's got the Cyber Defense Mission, and they, they weren't quite sure yet who was the supported and who was the supporting command. Um, so first point I'd make is, uh, at least on the American side where I know a lot more, we still have a, a fair amount of work to do in defining our lanes in the road. It doesn't mean that there's a problem, it just means we, we haven't done it yet. Um, the second point I would make is that the um, the expansion of the, f of the uh, military protective umbrella over the DIB, the DIB pilot, which was in the bottom left corner of my nice little chart, you know, is obviously a, a good model for extending uh, government protection. But it's critically dependent upon the consent of the DIB uh, 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 members, you know, the Lockheed Martins, the Boeings. Now, in the DIB, they have a huge incentive to do that. They want to continue to do business with the Department of Defense. They've got a lot of interest in wanting that to happen. Um, and their consent is, um, I would add, an enforced consent for their employees. Once Lockheed Martin comes in underneath the DIB pilot, you can't continue to work for Lockheed Martin as an engineer unless you say, I I'm giving up my privacy. Uh, so one question I would sort of ask, and I'll hang it out there, is. I don't think that that would necessarily work in Canada. Um, you know, I'm no Canadian privacy expert, but I have a sense that enforced consent in Canada is not deemed consent <laughs> um, in the same way that it is that it is effectively in America, where where that's completely you know, you've got a choice. They say you can quit your job as Lockheed Martin and go find an engineering job somewhere else, which you know is, you know we got nothing on Thomas Hobson, right? in terms of Hobson's choice. Um, but the second part is that there's ultimately some limit to how far the Defense Department can go in that, right? We might extend it to the nuclear facilities and the chemical facilities and other kind of mission critical things, but I can't imagine either politically or legally an extension that covered the healthcare industry um, or the education community. Um, so however far the defensive umbrella of the U.S. military goes, wherever that line eventually gets drawn, either by politics or by law, there's going to be a lot on the other side. I don't know whether the electric grid could even actually be pulled in. Um, I don't think the electric grid people would want to be pulled in, for one thing, but even assuming they wanted to, you know, there's... There's a constitutional boundary at some point that I don't, uh, it, on the American side of the equation, that I don't know where it is. Um, so it's a great model. It works effectively. Um, it may have limits in terms of applicability to Canadian infrastructure because of uniquely Canadian concerns. And it certainly has limits somewhere in America because of our own institutional and constitutional concerns. It's a good question, though. It is. A and I'm good actually. With the experience that I've got, the, the involvement that NORAD NORTHCAM has, and I apologize for not mentioning that earlier because I did know that, and I have I feel like a fool for not mentioning about the the involvement the, the NORAD NORTHCAM, the relationships on a regional basis with the JTTF, the National Guard, the the work that's actually being done. Um, I worry sometimes about too many cooks in the kitchen. As you stand up Cyber Command now, every one of the arms of the service arms themselves actually have their own Cyber Command, right? I mean, I think the they've all got one now, which is you know. 10th Fleet, Great. 24th Air Force. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one. In Canada, uh, the, the relationship between Canada and the U.S. for the NORA and NORTHCOM is very strong. In Canada itself, with Canadian Command, I am unaware, and, and it is just from not checking, I guess, of their involvement in looking at what's happening in Canada. 
for, for cyber, the role of DND in cyber. They obviously have uh, signals operations and a cyber element to that that is tied closely with things like the communication security establishment. That is directly related to protection of critical infrastructure and public safety and things like this. The model that I have seen from NORAD Northcom and the role that they they play in being able to provide the tactical support at a granular level right down to the asset owners themselves from a defense perspective, fantastic. I've actually seen that in, in action through exercises and it, it it's it's great. It, the outreach campaigns that they've actually gotten the ability to work with the, the, the joint task forces, National Guard, the regions, law enforcement, nothing to say but just outstanding. I think it's a great I think it's a great model. I think it's a great model, and I do believe that the future state of that with NORAD Northcom having that access to that information should, for all intents and purposes, be able to provide information proactive and reactively for the protection of the North American critical infrastructure on both sides of the border. On that, we're going to have to close. We are just about out of time. Uh, thank you very much for coming again. Um, we uh, heard a very fascinating conversations today. Um, we heard loud and clear safe harbor and liability protection is critical for the pr private sector. We heard from Mark that it's not how but what it's shared. The granular, uh, granularity of the, the information shared by the private sector is, is something that we want to uh, look into. Paul it would D minus on the DHS uh, and uh, public safety joint cybersecurity action plan. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we want to know more uh, clearer lanes on the military operations and the joint cyber center. Um, thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you again at the Wilson Center. Thank you.